so my name's Stuart Easton from Transparent Choice. We've, we've got David Dunning and Dan Dewis, uh, who will introduce themselves in a second. Um, uh, but what we're, what we're going to do today is, is have something a little bit special um, looking at sort of business integrated governance. So you've probably seen in the invitation and so on, the little acronym BIG, Business Integrated Governance. Um, this is a concept that, that David's kind of championed and whipped into life through an effort of sheer will force, uh, willpower, <laughs> I have to say, David. He's been ruthlessly whipping a whole bunch of us to, to get us to contribute and to help build. And um, just last week, last week, was it last week, the week before, we, we actually physically got our hands on a copy of the big bock. There it is, the big bock, the body of knowledge. Um, so, and there you go, Dan's got his out as well. So, um, so we thought we would celebrate the launch of the big bock uh, with this webinar. So with that, I, I, my job here today is really just to make fun of everybody else. Uh, so it's an easy one for me. So with that, uh, Dan, why don't you introduce yourself and then you can, we'll do a little bit of a Bridget Jones moment here. I'll introduce you, you introduce David. Fabulous. There you go, we've got slime and everything. But uh, so I'm Dan, I look after custom success partners and things here at Transparent Choice. Um, occasionally write the odd blog, appear on the odd webinar. And, and generally uh, make it nuisance of myself. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll be here to, to help, I guess, show how prioritization can kind of slot into big. So we, we've tried to sort of highlight, if you like, what we think is an important common ground um, between what we do and, and, and what, what, and what and sort of framework that Dave has developed. Um, talking of which, David, um, why don't you introduce yourself and, and your framework? Uh, well, I'm, I'm David. Um, uh, the big framework. I must uh, be clear. It's it's not mine. It's um, it's been uh, it's owned by a community interest company called uh, the Business Integrated Governance (CIC). It's been developed with inputs from over 138 people. Uh, there's a couple of uh, contributors on the call. Uh, Pam, for example, was ex instrumental in us uh, 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 creating the, the the product perspective on all this. Um, so I, I'm I'm uh, 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 leading the charge uh, in the uh, business integrated governance community interest company that develops that knowledge, and I'm also uh, a, a member of of Deep Team, which is a, a professional services company that helps organisations uh, make make best use of it. Um, so we, we've we've got a couple of perspectives, and and uh, I, I think they're very, two very interesting perspectives, which. Um, Hopefully, the material we present today will will uh, will be really interesting from from uh, from both of those points. Very good, David. I think you're driving uh, for now. Yes. Um, well, um, uh, everyone loves a bit of motherhood and apple pie, so uh, I guess th these are some uh, fundamental beliefs that I think will will drive uh, what we're going to discuss today. So you can agree or disagree with these things, um, but I think uh, the I'll, I'll just read this out, but. Um, it, for us, business success is based on achievement of purpose via the decomposition of purpose into operational and strategic objectives and effective delivery against business as usual, change and value creation. So uh, that's that's pretty much set in the scene quite big, Dan, I don't uh, I think. I think of it as like everything, everywhere, all at once. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, we've got... And, uh, and, and your perspective of... PMOs and EPMOs, Dan? Yeah, so, you know, we, what we've discovered recently up in Edinburgh, Chatham's People House of PMO, um, every organisation probably has a slightly different definition and a slightly different understanding of, of this space. But broadly, for, for the sake of what we're talking about today, we're seeing the PMO as sort of the owner of, um, if you like, the owner of um, best practice and delivery of value within a portfolio. Um, so very much kind of in, in, in sort of leading the charge on that side of things. Um, and, and, you know, for us, it's often the, often the, the core custodian of, of good prioritization. And then the EPMO is, is more of a, a sort of broader role where we're seeing that connection to strategy and sort of joining all the bits together in that broader governance role. So, um, yeah, hopefully many of you will relate to the different um, levels. Feel free to challenge us uh, in, in terms of the definitions. And ultimately, yeah, we, we hope everyone is gunning towards the epmo level in terms of the and this is and this is more just kind of so we've all got the same terminology right i mean there are so many different flavors of pmo and definitions and all the rest of it so this is just so we're all working from the same definition 
for today, I guess. Yeah, I, th I think the big guys, to, you, you, you talk about sort of support functions as a sort of mm. nice neutral term that wraps up everyone who could be all these different kind of acronyms. Um, Business support. You, you can offend everyone as opposed to just one or two uh, perspectives. <laughs> but but um, yeah, we, uh, we, we're we using these general terms just to discuss today. Um, but I think the, the thing is, if, if, if business success is based on achievement of blah, 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 and, and we see uh, PMOs and EPMOs as instrumental in, in, in enabling that to happen, um, we, we can't, we, we must also uh, agree um, that we need prioritization to be effective. If we can't prioritize, we can't deliver. We'll, we'll dig into that a little bit later. But if we're going to prioritize, then we need to be systematic. We're not going to prioritize out of thin air and without any coordination or organization. Uh, so our proposition is that if you're going to prioritize and you're going to do it systematically, then we need to be um, uh, we need to have an operator model uh, that, that's going to frame how we can do that. Um, so that that's the big motherhood and apple pie uh, statement before we get going. And anything to add, Stuart? Dan? No, it's it, it's brilliant. I mean, it, it's a it's a very simple concept, and it's one that we rattle on about time and time again. Yeah, just. Don't, don't get me started, David, because you won't stop me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, if this doesn't work, it, it's not just that uh, some someone won't get a bonus. It, it means that organisations don't fulfil their purpose. Uh, so it so it has uh, big, big uh, rewards and consequences. So then, what is what is this big thing? I, I'm not going to bore everyone to death um we're, we're gonna we're gonna go through um the big thing as 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 well as um everything else today so we'll try and tell this as a sort of a story um we'll, we'll introduce um uh big as the as a framework to help you get from purpose to strategic objectives to effective delivery um i'll, I'll introduce then the the uh, the, the place uh, of of a pmo within big uh Dan, Dan will then uh, show you quite a bit more. Do you want to signpost a little bit of that, Dan? Yeah, so we'll we'll talk about the, uh, I guess, prioritization of the PMO and, and introduce what we think the kind of the fundamentals are in terms of, you know, really good core operations. And then we'll start to look to the horizons and see what we think, you know, imagine imagine the kind of the the the, the, the future as, as as it could be with, with everything connected with with the right sort of systematic approach to, to value generation. We'll ask we'll ask you guys. Um so what's what's stopping um effective prioritization if it is indeed stopping effective prioritization? What what is stopping you? And we'll use Slido for that. Um Slido.com you can get up on your phone. I don't know if you've used those sorts of things before, but we'll have a little poll on Slido and we'll give you a Slido code to tap in. So you can you can just tap in your your thoughts and we'll 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 capture some thoughts live and comment on them as they come in. And we'll do a couple of those little polls if if that's okay with everyone. It's just it's good to see what folks are thinking. Um, we'll then um, introduce uh, where uh, an EPMO can add uh, can add value. We'll ask ask you guys. Uh, what uh, uh, you, you'd like an EPMO to do and, and offer you um, how uh, an EPMO, if we do continue to call it that, will offer you what that can do within business and great governance and, and wrap that up uh, with some calls to action, links to stuff and and uh, proposal for, for next steps. Uh, so that, that's where we are. Um, shall I just dive Let's in? Down? Let's go. Let's go. So then, um, what what's big? Business integrated governance. We we've just said in a, in the definition earlier, it's it's an operating model to enable to connection, uh, to enable connection from purpose to strategy to delivery and back again. We can visualize it. Uh, business integrated governance is a set of a set of cogs, a lot of a lot of cogs for delivery and and governance all happening at once within our organization. Um, and if we're not careful, those cogs misalign. They great. They don't work. Um, and the, the proposition is that if we can smooth our our uh, our governance operations, then then we can um, uh, more more reliably and and effectively uh, deliver our purpose in in all shapes and sizes of what that means. So um, if if we're going to take a, a, a catchphrase away about big, it's getting the organisation governance cogs to work together to achieve purpose. And there's there's a link um, to the body of knowledge there. And we'll repeat this link later, but it's it's free. You can be a member. It's no charge. It's um, 
as I say, uh, delivered by a community interest company, uh, you can you can uh, feast on it at your at your leisure. But um, having introduced that high level concept, uh, what does it then uh, what does it then mean to the PMO? Well, um, if if we're going to operate business integrated governance, we're going to have some components in place. We're going to have an effective organisation where, where there's clear structure, there are clear roles, there's there's some uh, corporate process that works. We're going to have effective governance. We're going to be able to make decisions. We're going to be able to manage compliance. Um, we're going to need information and data to enable that to happen. We're going to need to hold people people accountable. And have accountability is in, 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 within our culture. To make it happen, we're going to need effective business support, uh, which of course PMO fits in there. We'll need effective assurance to make sure we're doing the right things the right, right way, and leadership to enable us to get this going and to help us sustain it and to to keep it embedded within our organisation. So th those are the, the the big components. Again, uh, I'll, I can explain more on a different date in, in some more detail. But with a PMO perspective, well, if a, if a PMO enables achievement of business objectives, as we discussed earlier, then there are a number of uh, huge contributions uh, a PMO will provide. Um, it'll, it'll be providing the project governance. It'll be um, uh, providing lots of information to internal and external stakeholders. It'll be supporting people to be accountable. Um, it'll be carrying out a service level to, to make this work. So the so PMO is already um, uh, providing a, a chunky aspect to what integrated governance uh, can be, but the the the, the trick there are trickier bits that maybe maybe a PMO will find it less easy to carry out, uh, less less easy to perhaps carry out independent assurance, um, perhaps simply because of its place in the organisation, its visibility in the organisation, or perhaps even because it can't. E so easily access information that's outside its domain. It might well have um, a, a leadership uh, that that is that is senior and, and respected, but perhaps not quite at the level in the organisation where it can be the can be most effective. Um, we, we might also find that um, a, a PMO doesn't necessarily have access and integration to all of our corporate data sources. Um, I, I've come and work with many PMOs that have had to collate their own data and had to gather information and, and, and pull it together and not truly been integrated like other core business functions. And, and I, I hear uh, many people uh, uh, complain or, or worry about, about their, their remit and responsibility. And I hear, hear many uh, PMOs uh, offering to, 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 to explain to their business what the PMO does and what services it offers. Uh, it, it's. I find it, it, it really curious that that that's necessary if if a PMO is well embedded, understood, and has clear remit and role within an organisation. So I think I think we can help a PMO carry out its duties very effectively, and I think we can make it um, bigger and better. If you'll excuse the pun, if if we can plug it in, plug it in with big. So, David, can I ask a really, really, re I'm going to be the one who asks the stupid question that nobody else dare. And actually, it's not really me asking it. I had a conversation with someone who is very, very experienced in this kind of area earlier today, told them we were going to do this webinar uh, about business integrated governance. And, and they understood what business meant. They understood what integrated meant. But they were puzzled. They were a little puzzled about this term governance and what it really means so in this context right you've drawn this beautiful wheel what does governance actually mean in in this context uh it's this decision making a compliance management so governance is is what helps us uh, uh carry out our accountability it help, helps us make decisions helps us set the policy and the recipe with which we do business so so in in uh so governance of a project for example is is uh, compliance uh, with respect to how it works. It's compliance with respect to business case. It's decision making around it. So, it, so, so governance um, is all about uh, getting getting the, the 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 acceptance of objectives, the the um, uh, acceptance of responsibility for for getting them carried out, the the acceptance of um, explaining to the business how progress is happening, and for somebody to stand up and say. That's my job. I, I'm going to take take responsibility and be accountable for that. 
um, differentiating between governance and accountability. Governance is about uh, uh, sorry, account, uh, governance is about accepting accountability, and and management is about executing responsibility. So we, we can def definitely distinguish between responsibility and accountability. The, the bot covers all this stuff um, in, in, in quite in quite some depth. There's, there's this big chapter on 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 what governance is and what it what it means in this context. Uh, governance itself and what governance bodies are. There's there's uh, there's quite a bit to to chew through. But if we think of it as as uh, the framework within which decisions are made, and and the, the process, the orchestration of that decision making process. But all those decision making processes, then, then we've we've summed it up. Beautiful, thank you. So, um, if if uh, if uh, we've got uh, we're in good shape with respect to what we can do with the PM already, um, uh, what else can can uh, ha having a, an integrated framework within which the PMO sits? How can it help uh, the PMO? Well, uh, if you have an integrated framework within which, which the PMO sits then it, uh, the, the idea is that remit and responsibility are quite clear, that the business understands what, what, what we do because it's, it's defined as part of how the business works. Um, the, 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 how, how we fit with corporate governance isn't something we have to explore. It's defined. It's, it's part of the integrated governance approach. So those are two, two key things that uh, will help PMO function straight away. Uh, tactical things. Um, if 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 a PMO has has defined its own information sources and compiled its own tools, then with an integrated approach to governance, uh, there's there's greater focus on sharing data and 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 justifying uh, bigger and better tools. So we, we should find it less difficult to uh, to manage to gather and manage information. Um, with respect to to leadership and accountability. Um, we can lift up the, the level of leadership, perhaps, that, that we have for a PMO because it's a more corporate and integrated business service. It's, it's not something that's uh, for a particular program or a particular uh, area of the business. It's, it's now got a, got a senior uh, 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 pivot point within the organization. And um, if, it, if it's charged with um, supporting people discharge their accountability, um, the, the people are will be much more grateful to receive support if, if they're accountable than if if they're not. Um, that, that's certainly a, a, a quote I've had back to me a few times. And um, what it means is that um, we can be clearer about the, the service level that, that we provide and, and we can change uh, our PMO from perhaps being a, a support office to being a, a fully fledged business function that's, that's alongside the other key business functions that we have in our organization. So for, for some, it, it might just up the visibility and up the profile and up the resourcing and, and leadership level that uh, that they they need, they they um, are subjected to uh, day to day. So there are, I think there's some real benefits uh, of, of big as a concept to to uh, uh, promoting and, and plugging in a PMO uh, uh, more significantly. But um, moving on to our our subject of prioritization. Um, for example, uh, if uh, in, in, in most scenarios, uh, our PMOs support the prioritization of projects. In most scenarios, they're looking to compile information for, for project prioritization, looking to oversee and, and support fair accountability because projects have been prioritized correctly. Um, and another comment here, if we, if we can't prioritize, um, how can we manage accountability? Um, if you don't have accountability established, um, perhaps uh, strategic planning is is pretty pointless because we, we can plan all we like, but we're not holding people to account. It's it's pointless, some would argue. And um, I guess our, our PMOs assist in the readiness for prioritization and, and we'll be able to ask the questions, um, are we prioritizing the right projects? So... So a BMO, a PMO is already doing lots of big stuff, but there are things that it, it may find difficult to without a big context. There's lots of benefits for a PMO as being part of business support in a big context, and and uh, certainly prioritization is is a, is a key big uh, facet that um, that we need to enable a PMO to support more effectively. So that this is when I think we move on to to, to Dan's piece where we talk about prioritization is that about now i think so have i got control david or am i uh, going to do the magic eye movement every time i want to, to to do a build 
or just I, I I failed to work out how to give you remote control. So just give me a thumbs up or or, or shout slide, at me please. or something. There yes. you go. Uh, just do the bills in comedy style. I'll kind of surf along with them and just catch up as you do them. Um, so look, the, the prioritization, like you know, let's be clear, it's not rocket science. Um, we're going to talk about three basic steps that can deliver prioritization. And, and again, this is our sort of this is our sort of with with. We think every PMO should be doing this, frankly, and this should just be a basic function of the PMO. To David's point, if you can see it in the context of big, it will increase the probability of it succeeding um, and will hopefully push on open doors. So we're going to sort of alongside, you know, what, what the, the the context David's given us, we'll just look at the some levers for how we do it. And I was thinking about doing a live demo, then I decided that uh, a live demo with slidos and everything else would just invite disaster so we just need to do kind of regular screenshot type approach so um i would say if you like the look of it Stuart and i'll probably be doing a live demo later in the month and join us then um so we're going to organize backlog we're going to define value but we're going to define value properly rather than in a way that's a bit naff uh, and we're going to pick the right projects so organize define pick. hit it david i am trying to click it there we go so, can software really deliver uniformity in a diverse organizational culture? Can we go from a situation where we've got, you know, feline-based chaos on, on the left to herded cats on the right? Can we? Big fat nope. No, we can't. Um, and frankly, anyone selling software that says they can, I think is probably suffering from optimism bias. Um, why? Because I don't think software alone can solve a human issue and, and collaboration is predominantly in our experience a human collaboration issue it's about people working together um in order to um in order to come up with the right choices for the organization so at the end of the day there's so much subjectivity inherent in good prioritization that you need to get a system that gets people working with people in order to deliver good outcomes and that, by the way, was partly an excuse for me to use a bit of generative AI as to what an organized group of cats look like. Um, so use software, but you, you, obviously we can use software to create common structure. So again, this is this is how we, we approach it. So I'm going to introduce three kind of personas on the left here, right? Um, and, and, and we're going to think about what prioritization means with, with three very kind of crude hats on in terms of different types of people. So we've got the finance guy. You can tell he's a finance guy because he's got a calculator. Uh, we've got the, the next one. Now you can tell she's the boss because she has a steely look about her and uh, a suit. And you can tell that she is the worker because she has a high vis jacket and a hat. So um, what we're doing with, 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 with these groups is we can actually then provide the structure that brings requirements that they have in their areas together. Um, and we can have a documented process. We can have transparent backlogs. We can have shared decision gates. So decisions are made with a, the same sort of structure and logic. We can have a live database rather than little pots of stale data hiding in Excel in different corners of the organization. We can automate data collection. So it's not kind of death by attachment uh, and, 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 and outlook. And we can work with integrated connectivity. So we can start to make it easy to say, you know what, you guys like Jira, you guys like Excel, you guys like napkins in Starbucks. Um, we are going to struggle to force you to use a different system or tool because you are people and you resist that kind of uniformity. But we can bring together the your different outputs and put them into one place in order to enable us to prioritize properly across these different bits of the organization. So, what does that mean? How do we do it? Uh, we start by collecting projects. So, you know, we can do, you know, we do, sometimes we do kind of um, uh, request forms where you can really um, share the uh, the ability to, to ask for projects and, 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 and ideate uh, broadly across the organization. Sometimes we'll connect to another system. Sometimes we'll bring stuff in from Excel. The idea is that, that you know, the software should be flexible to the organization. Uh, the stage gating is, again, flexible to the organization. So the idea is you focus on the decision and the outcomes 
and you have transparency and a lack of ambiguity. So many places are never quite sure if something's if, if something funded, not funded, what's the status, what's the stage, where are I with that data versus that data. So just having a bit of structure and clarity is in, via, in this case, Kanban is, is we think a really valuable support. And uh, thirdly, signals David, there we go, defining resource. So again, if you want to be able to be flexible and agile in how you allocate resource, it's important to get in early in the process and have common definitions. So you can actually understand um, who wants what, as in parallel, you, you work out who should get what based on the value that they're gonna deliver the organization. So just a bit of common structure enables much, much better collaboration through the process. And that's a really important point there, Dan, because we might prioritize, but what, what are we prioritizing for? It's it's to deploy resources, funds, and leadership, I guess. So the, the resources bit <laughs> is crucial. Exactly. And this is where, you know, a framework like big and, and, and just a conscious deployment where you're trying to do this on purpose uh, is really useful because you don't have to get everyone using the same PPM tool. We know that takes years and, and half the time doesn't work. This is about saying, Right, we just need a little bit of structure to bring us together. So the second point we want to talk about was value creation uh, uh, and, and, and how different definitions of value are massively divisive within an organization. So I'm going to go back to my simple stereotypes for, for this piece. Now, here's finance guy, if you remember, spot the calculator. Um, and, and he's probably looking at predictable modeling data. He likes, he thinks cost savings are fantastic. Uh, he thinks revenue growth is pretty good as well, although a bit, bit shakier. But he can put stuff in his Excel model, point to a number, generate an ROI, and know that the project is good because the finance data says so. so that's his point of view. Let's bring go back to our steely-eyed leader. Now, she's looking at her hard-to-quantify strategic objectives, the big-picture stuff. She could kind of come up with a business case for it, but there'd be a lot of assumptions in there. Or maybe it's the really impossible to quantify stuff like the ESG agenda uh, you know, and, and, and delivering some of those stakeholder commitments. They're important, they're her perspective. Or we can go to the other extreme, go to the front line. They're in the front line, they see the reduce, they, they see you know reducing the risk of things breaking. They know that machine's on its last legs and needs fixing. Uh, they they you know, this, the front line is, is if you get it right, comes up with some fantastic ideas that are simple common sense things, not sort of big picture, big ticket items. So there's lots of different threads here. In terms and, and, of to be, and to be really clear, right, um, you know, sometimes we talk about this stuff as if strategic objectives and operational objectives are somehow different. They're not. They're just objectives. And so your big strategic objectives will drive operational objectives. And then within those operational units, you, you know, the, the executives within those units will have a strategy for delivering their operational goals, right? So within that unit, those become the strategic objectives within that unit, and so on down the organization. So, so you know, this, this conversation about strategic objectives and operational objectives, it can be a little confusing. But it's really just it just it, it's really just a matter of perspective. What's an operational objective to the strategic, you know, to the to the to the boss with the jacket on is is going to be is going to be you know that's going to be an operational thing it's going to be strategic to the person with the hard hat right so so don't get too lost in some of the terminology here it's it's just you know understanding that you've got business to run business as usual which are the, which is what what I guess we really mean when we're talking about these object uh, these uh, operational things and then there are change projects, which is, which are about changing the way we do business. D David, do I, is that a reasonable way of describing it? Yeah, we need we line a sight from from the purpose we have as a business, the objectives the organisation set, through to what it is that we're going to need to do. Some of which will be change, some of which which will be value creation, some of which will be be operational. So we need that line of sight to to connect us all up. And uh, what what's very interesting is when we, when we can spot that um, a project in, in this domain has no no strategic connection. And that, then you can then then that's going to, I guess, uh, be flagged up in, in the prioritization process. Um, and that, that's what uh, that's what we, we're trying to uh, deal with in big. And I guess that's what prioritization helps us helps us uh, uh, spot. Uh, and uh, Dirk, Dirk's just asked the question, what does ESG stand for? It stands for egregiously sloping gateau. 
which which uh, which uh, gato is the Spanish word for cat, and it's the name of Dan's cat because it's only got three legs. It is in fact egregiously sloping. Um, so no, it's you're it's not nice to it. You're you bragging. Yeah. <laughs> and and Pam, Pam's uh, uh, asked a question about objectives and key results OKRs that, that that's that's the, uh, the the way that we can we can cascade from our objectives through through to the organization so that it has uh, things it can, can prioritize and, and and focus on delivery so OKRs if you've used to that acronym uh, that, that that that's the backbone uh, for uh, and, I, and I guess ultimately the the, the, the items that uh, that we prioritize of uh, objectives and key results too prioritization criteria which we'll come on to in a second and okrs I think they're probably some close cousins we'll, we'll kind of we'll roll into that as we go through so just on this perspective right so dude with his calculator is like people are oh, bean counters never get it right leadership will be like ah oh, they've got some pet project some idea they like operations are like oh, you never understand the business you just don't get it you're often doing your own thing and what you're doing by allowing these silos to build up and Jump on the chat if you see these silos or if you think I'm speaking nonsense. But um, the, uh, the, the the idea about these um, these perspectives is that people don't always understand someone else's definition of value. They can be in the same organization. They can sit next to each other in the office, but they have a different perspective on what value means for the organization. And if they don't share a perspective on what value means, they're never going to be able to prioritize beyond horse trading, uh, which is not very productive um, as a way of getting things done. Oh, it's pressed the right button. So we've got our diverse perspectives now. So we've got diverse perspectives. Um, we resolve this through, we use a system called AHP. Um, this is a hierarchy from AHP. If you press the button again, a little thing, will a little snazzy bill will come. There we go. So um, back to our personas, right? calculator guy he's like right these are my key financial metrics and hopefully he can then explain why they're important um and, and and bring people on board with that but actually they need to sit alongside the strategic objectives so we can see what matter what are the key tenets of the strategy what are the key high level um goals um the esg which Stuart stands for environmental societal and governance i think <laughs> basically kind of green stuff governance stuff all that malarkey and doing the right thing on a broader community basis. Um, obviously, every CEO is highly committed to that agenda. Um, and then, you know, again, over on the operational side, um, why my IT manager is wearing a hard hat, I'm not sure. It's obviously very dangerous code. Um, but but you've got, uh, you know, the idea that sometimes common sense ideas, are some simple common sense things, or the value of fixing stuff before it breaks, the kind of maintenance agenda, which has value. It's just not necessarily the value that the finance guy thinks of or that the strategy or the, the, the leader thinks of, but it has huge value. And anyone that's had to deal with a broken thing can appreciate that. So we're starting to deconstruct and define value in a way that opens up all those different perspectives and gives us the platform to quantify the value of different projects in a single framework. So we build our framework, and then if we roll to the next slide, we use, uh, oh, look at that. We do have, I forgot to say, yeah, we've got, if, if this is interesting space to you, we've got a free ebook. We'll send the link out after this um, where you can explore how this works. It's not, again, it's not rocket science. A few, few principles, a bit of learning we've made along the way. Um, so have a look at that or, or reach out. Remember, folks, that that free download link, I've stuck it on the links that, uh, at the end of the presentation. So uh, bear that in mind and it'll come up so you can click it later or, or write it down later. Yeah, we can't click in Zoom. We're not like that. So the way we actually then start to merge all those different perspectives is via a system called Pairwise, which does pretty much what it says on the tin. Um, so, you know, you, you can have... Um, a debate where you're literally saying, what is more important? Is it the finance metrics or the strategy metrics? And you go, well, of course, both are important. But as a group, you can then start to discuss their relative importance. You can represent one point of view, you can represent another point of view. And the little screenshot underneath is just a, a illustration of capturing that data where you get people to say what they think and then bringing it 
into one place where you can have a good structured debate. And there's also huge value at this point, of course, in focusing on what drives value. Remember, we're defining what is valuable to us. We're not looking at projects. So once you get into projects, you're getting into horse trading, you're getting into rabbit holes about specific bits of functionality. This is a little bit more esoteric, a little bit more theoretical. Why are we here? Why do we do projects? Why do we do BAU? Why do we spend money? Let's have a debate and learn from each other. So the stuff you get at the top is effectively a nice normalized scoring framework. So hopefully you can see you've got the platform um, for scoring projects. But critically on the right, what you're seeing is a debate. So it's important we balance hard and soft goals. Oh yeah, it is, okay. So those strategic goals versus the financial goals, we can start to understand they both have importance, but we can decide which is more important to us now as an organization. We can start to understand the point of view of that person sitting next to us in the office who before we thought was just a sort of, you know, bean counter who just didn't get it. And then I think if I final build there, you know, you, you're starting to have a debate we should have had before. And we hear this from clients, it's just ripped off of a quote from a client. You know, this is the debate we should have had years ago because we go round and round in circles. But until we have this debate, we don't sort anything out. Because fundamentally, if you've got disagreements at this level, ignoring them doesn't make them go away. It just pushes the debate out into endless cycles of meetings where you never get anything done because you have fundamentally different beliefs about what defines value. And this is you know, going right back to David's first slide, right? And I'll read out that first, first bullet point of the, the whole presentation again, just for a second, right? So business success is based on achievement of purpose. Okay, that's the, fir the very first bit of the first bullet point, achievement of purpose. This is us getting agreement on what that purpose is, how we can measure purpose. And so that is the absolute foundation for everything else that, that follows, right? So, so this is, we, we belabor this, we spend a lot of time thinking about how to make this process better, slicker, more compelling. Um, and the reason is because this is the foundation for everything that you do in the, to, 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 uh, to deliver both operational change and, and uh, transformational change within organizations. Um, there's just a comment from Nicole about uh, uh, emo uh, maturity. So I personally, I don't think you need to be, from an organizational point of view, hugely mature. I think where you need maturity is in a leadership perspective. So the alternative to doing this, arguably, is just the boss says what they want, they shout, and they get it. <laughs> It's mature, exactly. It's maturity yeah. behavior. You need the person who's in charge to go, do you know what? I know that I'm probably not right all the time because I'm a person, I'm human. And there's there's knowledge around me that can really help me make a better decision. So I think the best leaders, the mature leaders, are the ones that can recognize that they don't necessarily have all the answers in their head and that syndicating that decision-making process um, through the experts actually produces a better result. And I think it is important to draw a difference between the process maturity, because we've seen customers that have deployed our software that have gone from the very lowest level of maturity, total chaos, to a really high level of maturity in a couple of months deploying the software, right? But we've also seen customers where, you know, their processes have all been very mature, but the, the supposed adults in the room have behaved like, like toddlers. Right, and and they've really struggled. So you're absolutely right. It's about a des it's about the you know I come back to that first sentence, David, that you had on the first slide. It's about an acceptance amongst the leadership team that the whole point you know that business success is based on achievement of purpose, right? That that's the the first few words of the the bullet point, right? And 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 so if there is buy into that statement, then this this process can work. If there's no buy into that. You're going to have a, it's going to be difficult to make big or anything else stick, right? So, so you need some buy into that statement first. But and I think just to, I think I need to shut up and 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 let let uh, Dan go on. But but for mature, maturity for me isn't a barrier. It's what you need to achieve so that you can, you can carry out the capabilities that you need to carry out. So for me, maturity is is just a measure. And, and if we need to be more capable because we need to do more sophisticated things, then we need to develop the maturity. But I don't see maturity as something over which we have to leap. It is something we need to develop. That's yeah. just my, my viewpoint. Yep. Brilliant. Next slide, please. 
What a concept. That's a new concept for me, by the way, David, is letting Dan get on with it. <laughs> As opposed yeah, to presenting. Yeah, I forgot you were joining us, Stuart. Otherwise, I'd put this in for an hour and a half. Uh, <laughs> so, automate targeted data capture. So, you know, again, this is this is how you score projects. So we've built our framework. We can actually now start to pull the lever and see the results, right? So the point is uh, you can actually get experts, not necessarily project owner, not necessarily all the same person. You can get the people who know most about projects to give you feedback in a structured way as to how useful they are. There's a bit of data science in here in terms of like nice sort of like at scale, a um, bit of technology for targeting, all good, all good. Press the button one more time. We are on double speed now. And you get this. Um, now, I like this because this we see this for real all the time. Um, you know, if you work as a team, you will reduce noise. Noise being like one person on their own will make stupid decisions. Read a book by Dan Kahneman if you want to go further into that. Or just bias because one person who has skin in the game isn't necessarily going to be the best judge of value. You reduce gaming, likewise. Similarly, you know, people kind of thinking, oh, I'll just put a high mark on this, and you know, I'm not accountable for what what happens later, so I'll just get the resource and then, haha. Or stupid. Um, again, we all have moments when we put stupid data into the spreadsheet. Um, if there are three of us, four of us, we are less likely to be stupid. Um, and if we if we then work together as a group to understand outliers, we can flatten those mistakes and come up with a better data, better data point as a group. So, and like any process, prioritization, garbage in, garbage out. So this is how you stop putting garbage in. And if you've got a spreadsheet with like one person putting in data, chances are you've got a lot of garbage in there. Indeed. Next slide, we, please. We're nearly, nearly at the slider, aren't we? Uh, nearly not quite yeah, getting there right so good data needs buy-in right so we in the software will produce a prioritization matrix right you probably all produce one in excel or on a whiteboard or something at some point right but the point is that definition around project value is something you've worked together to build you've listened to each other you've worked together you've been systematic about how you get the best data from the experts therefore you have that critical second ingredient of buy-in people know the data is good. And with that, we can then move on to picking projects. So we put the data into a nice, we call it efficient frontier, uh, and effectively you can then pick the best value projects based on resource constraints. So you can start to say, you know, this is my portfolio. There's a little bit more to it than this, but this is my portfolio based on the resource I have that delivers the most value. So you've got a real fact-based data-led process that's rational, fair, and gets the answer more or less right. And in terms of time saving, you're also now starting to save time and benefit because you're not going to spend your time doing U-turns, having meetings about meetings and, and trying to backtrack because nobody agreed on the value definition. And critically, we've now got our three bods here building collective commitment, collective accountability against the choices they've made, against the choices they've not made. Um, so there's clarity uh, as you move into execution to say who's got the resource, who hasn't got the resource, who's accountable for delivering value, who's accountable for making do with what they've got. Database decisions, less politicking. Um, uh, what more could you want? Absolutely. Uh, just just a really, really quick thing before we leave this slide, if I, if I may. Sorry, I'm going to derail everything again, David. But the so the prioritization matrix that Dan's got there, I, you know, if you Google project prioritization or, or ask chat GPT what you know, what methods you could use to prioritize projects you will find prioritization matrix as a way of prioritizing projects and I have to tell you here and now it isn't prioritizing prioritization matrix is a visualization that's all it is it's a visualization tool it doesn't help you prioritize anything prioritization is figuring out where projects go on the vertical axis right, the value axis. That's the prioritization process. And so just having a chart isn't enough. It's the process for putting the dots in the right place on the chart that is the prioritization. So please, 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 when you're out there Googling, looking how to do things like project prioritization, um, <clears throat> don't necessarily believe what you see. There's a whole body of knowledge and research into how to do this right. 
and um, and most articles that you find on prioritization, at least online, really are incomplete at worst, uh, at best, excuse me, um, but just plain wrong in many, many cases, right? So, so when we, you know, when you see things like prioritization matrix, remember that's just a visualization behind that. It's the process of putting the dots, how you put the dots, how you calculate where the dots go on the chart that delivers that buy-in. And it's the buy-in actually that is the important bit. Right? The, the data is just a number, right? But it's buy-in to that number that matters. That's what lets you make good decisions quickly. David, I'm gonna shut my mouth now. <laughs> for, for about the next 10 seconds anyway. I'm, I'm biting my tongue. I've, I've answered a question Terry's raised in in the chat. We we could it, we just don't have time to delve into it. We come back to it at the end, Terry, if if that's okay. But uh, I, I recognise your point. Let's hit the next slide, and then uh, I think we're into the slide after that. So, and quickly look. So the point is, I think it's important to understand we are giving the organisation the right to say no. Uh, David pulled me up earlier, and this is not the PMO necessarily saying no; it's recommending no. But we all know that recommending no in some organizations is a real career limiting uh, thing to do, right? But now, if you've got a process in place, no can mean no. We, 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 if we do this, if we take on more projects, we're going to mess up our productivity. And if we mess up our productivity, we will deliver less. No, because if, you know, it, what we'll do is we'll delay our most important projects because we're putting too many projects in. If we say yes to everything. We're not going to deliver the most important things. No, because we have a robust, fair process that says so, because there are more important projects that we are going to do instead. And then no, because, you know, it's, I arguably there are better projects for the organization, projects that deliver more value in a way that hopefully everyone can say, yeah, that's fair. We can't do everything. We will do better if we are able to focus and I can feel empowered and engaged knowing that the right thing's being done. Information rather than emotion-based decision-making. Yes. So um, let's, let's um, everyone's got their phone phone hand. Um, and if you hit slido.com, we're going to uh, ask you to, to just uh, give us a, a few remarks, if you wouldn't mind. Um, so what's stopping you from systematically prioritizing at the moment maybe you are systematically prioritizing i don't know give it give us some comments uh if if you're struggling to systematically prioritize is it because you don't have a method you don't have a tool there's no framework within which you can manage it um there's there's lack of will to be objective people like their politicking uh there's no one to champion the process um what is it what what are the what um what are the barriers what are the pain points you're you're facing in 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 uh, systematically prioritizing now um when i flip to the next slide uh though wow those of you that are uh, generous enough to have, have put in comments will have will have put them there so we me and dan we're just gonna uh, watch them come in but you've been so quick <laughs> frantically put some in ourselves yeah uh, <laughs> start reading I, instead of typing that wasn't me i had my hands i was I would, that's really thank you everyone uh conflicting metrics um yeah, how how do you how do you catch the conflicting metrics, the conflicting priorities by stakeholders? Um, th these are all things to be dealt with, I guess. Um, you, you guys are the experts on the prioritization piece, so um, uh, yeah. Remark. And, and yeah, thank, thanks for anonymous for that third point. Now the, uh, the, the 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 conflicting metrics is is absolutely what Pairwise is there to do. You can't prioritize between areas if everything has its own special axes. Everything is its own pot. Um, you need to be able to kind of create that, that aggregation um, in order to have some agility as an organization. And, and, and that lack of priorities, conflicting priorities by stakeholders, I think that one is, uh, I, I don't think I've ever seen an organization where we've walked in and that has not been the case. We've had organizations tell us that's not the case. And as soon as you start asking questions, they start arguing different points of view. Right. So, yeah. uh, so that one, that one's very astute. I like that. Whoever that anonymous was, that's that's bang on the money. I think. And and similarly, the the lack of discussion. Um, yeah, absolutely. If if you have the loud, you know, the default often for prioritization is the loudest voice, right? right? The hippo, the person in charge says, "This is what we're doing." I have decided, um, which usually goes wrong, particularly as you get to an organization that's of a scale. That person is simply 
not able to get across all the details. So they're going to end up picking the the thing that's in the back of their head, the thing that they relate to from when they were, you know, more operational, um, which is generally not a great idea. Um, and and the, the poorly stated strategic goals is, is kind of the other side of the same coin of not having, you know, different priorities from different stakeholders. You know, if those goals were clear and it was beautifully laid out, as David's first slide implied it should be, then then you wouldn't have that problem. Uh, but again, just about every organization we deal with has has this challenge to a greater or lesser degree. Yeah, and we find some sometimes building criteria is a case of, you know, making the best you can with some interviews and some sort of bits of, you know, bits of presentation. And sometimes it's a case of going, oh, we've got a very good structure. We can just put it in the right format. So, yeah, different different PMOs have different levels of um strategic kind of quality to deal with. And that last answer captures, so we've got a little list of, of uh, the top 10 pain points around prioritization, signs you need prioritization. And we, we trot these out at all the trade shows and have people kind of tick them off and doing a, a straw poll. And, and this this answer at the top of the screen right now, that's hit a whole bunch of them, right? Dan, we've got, we've got that's pretty good. priority number one. We've got yeah. we've got oh. big projects stealing resources. We've got the loudest voice, right? The political sponsors banging his feet and saying, "Give it to me," right? You got everything going on in that one. So whoever you are, please go to our website, fill in a form. Honestly, tell us. Yeah, we need to I talk. Know should, I know we should probably go on with the presentation, but this is fascinating. But the, <laughs> it is, the, right? the it's it's there's a sort of it's interesting that execs will will, will observe the problem that we need better prioritization, and then fail to recognize that they are in fact part of that problem because they're the one setting you know all sorts of chaos going on by interfering and frankly by not having a proper governance process and this is why you know this is why we like talking to david right this is this is the governance structure is actually what starts to control this kind of rogue behavior um and and hopefully you know as an industry we can kind of grow up a bit and be a bit more data-led rather than like Crazy CEO, uh, Ed. Terry's, Terry's asked, sort of, Terry's getting a bit worried about resources and where are resources in this whole discussion. So, Dan, do you want to talk a little bit about resources and where they come in? Yeah, look, I think I sort of flashed them up at the beginning and then uh, decided to sort of um, control myself about going down too many rabbit holes. So, resources, you can, in a way, it's you know, you can you can, you can do estimates a little bit like you do um, uh, value. You can sort of ask people what they think. And, you know, a bunch of wet fingers is better than one wet finger in terms of estimates. Um, you can build detailed models and put that data in. Every Everyone has different maturity, depending on well, what stage they're doing prioritization. Um, so, yeah, you either get the data you've got or you estimate the data you don't have. The, co the key point is there's no point in ranking projects if you've got no sense of scale. So you just have to be able to differentiate, you know, the monsters from the tiddlers. Um, because the tiddlers are not going to deliver as much value as the monsters, but that doesn't mean you should just do massive projects. And I think we all see sometimes, you know, a bit of like project constipation where you sort of get blocked up trying to only do big things, um, but you need a little bit of that kind of velocity that comes from just delivering Guys, smaller, this, quick wins. This, 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 this is a big discussion. So, so we, we, when we're prioritizing, we're not just coming up with a score. We need, do need to understand a rough idea of resource demand, cost demand, leadership time. We also need to understand risk. So, so the, the we, we're flipping, flipping through it. But uh, I, I, I guess we need to offer folks a, a more detailed, deep dive. And may, maybe we'll, we'll in the follow up blog that we write, we'll, we'll signpost how the resort, resource funds, leadership time, and risk also come into the prioritization process. So uh, not 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 trying to avoid the subject, just got other other stuff to to ping into. But folks, thanks very much for for the, for making these notes. We'll we'll record them and pass them on. Keep tapping away if you want to. But we're going to answer some of these things because some of these things are about strategic goals, and uh, that's that's where I think we're going with the EPMO. So for some uh, EPMO, uh, so at the start of our session, EPMO said. Uh, to, to enable definition and balancing of business objectives. Well, that that's that's a, a nice definition that um, we stated at the start, but many others uh, don't have that as their uh, uh, definition for an EPO, EPMO. Uh, some people um, uh, see an EPMO as as the as the uh, um, focal point for project management within within across the enterprise. 
Some people see it as the focal point for doing big projects. Uh, but clearly, um, we, we believe that uh, the EPMO can do something else. And we, we've kind of um, run out a little bit of time now to ask you about um, what it is that uh, you're, you do you have an EPMO or what it could do that it's not? Would you would just... Uh, we, just, we just run run out of time to to pick up on that but but this was just basically setting up the presentation to uh and, and please do if you want to chip make some notes and add comments uh please chip in it'll be the poll will be open but I we're going to then um move on to say well what else can the epmo do beyond be a big pmo or be a a, a place where project management is is uh focused for the organization and it it all all um, revolves around um, uh, the uh, several things. It's it's the relation to strategy. So um, those of you that have been looking at some of the big stuff will see that uh, as an organisation at the very highest levels, will be uh, a, a, an, org an organisation will have a current state. It'll have uh, opportunities and threats that hit it. It'll have imperatives from from regulation, a stare, a shareholders' expectations. There's, there's a pathway and a, a strategic process that that uh, processes all of the um, drivers we have as a business. Um, comes up with a a, a, a vision and a, and a strategic plan and cask and breaks that down into objectives and related key results. Uh, OKRs as as Pam asked, that, that we can then um, cascade into the business. So, so if, if this strategic process isn't functioning, then it's very difficult to prioritize our projects because we don't have that, that uh, strategic basis to, to aim for. So, so this, this is a, a, a possible area that our EPMO can get into, um, or, or, or if it's already occupied, uh, it, it, to not get into, but to, to connect with more effectively. So, Purpose uh, place of the EPMO and big to to look after the, the pathway from purpose to strategy. Um, and another another candidate area, uh, uh, the strategy to delivery. So we've we've talked about the the process, the strategic process. How do we get strategy into the business? How how do we um, take those objectives, prioritize them, deploy our funds and leadership time between those threads of activity to achieve our strategy. So remember, strategy isn't just about change. Strategy is about developing products. It's about um, our business performing as, as well as uh, change happening. So, so how, does, how do we get resources deployed effectively between these different threads? Uh, and again, this is a, a, can, a strategy implementation, as we're calling it. This is a candidate area that, that an EP, EPMO can step into. Maybe folks have this covered already. I don't know. Um, I just just uh, firing on. I, I realise we're at we're over time, and people may need to go. But I'll I'll, I'll just finish this point because it'll be it'll it'll these points it'll be in the recording. Um, and and in, in addition to the 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 uh, strategic uh, uh, process, in addition to the uh, the implementation approach we, we'll we, this we'll need to rebalance and re-steer as time goes on this isn't this prioritization isn't a one-off exercise we're going to have to keep on top of this so so um it is, is an opportunity for our for our epmo to help uh organize the the balance and choice making between um things in in change world things in uh, project things in business as usual world and things in value creation space uh, this is certainly an opportunity for uh, for a, a, an EPMO to step beyond its its uh, project limitations to to connect and orchestrate decision making across all of these these different priorities. Um, so big big discussions, big discussions. Um, and um, Dan, I think this this goes back back to you now, doesn't it? Um, yeah. Look, so so you know. EPMO takes you into a new space, right? So we, we've got a, a space man. So we, we've 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 sort of gone from you know into we're now heading into strategy development, implementation, delivery, and yeah, actually you might start to push out towards other teams that do this. And to some extent, the key point is you've got a successful function that owns this space. Whether it's the EPMO, whether it's a change management office or a strategy office, doesn't particularly matter what it's called. But the key point is if you don't have this function you'll probably struggle to reach that next level of um, 
competence in terms of, of that kind of governance framework and the prioritization that flows through it. And those issues about not knowing what the strategy is to connect my projects to will persist. Yeah, absolutely. Or, you know, the strategy will be sufficient, won't be well defined enough to be useful uh, in terms of prioritization. So we'll whistle but through the, the last couple, I think. Picture, is the idea of that picture that if you don't do your strategy definition, you don't get to where you're going because because the guy thinks he's on the moon. But if you look in the background, the moon's still up there. Very good. Ah. Very good. Ah. <laughs> anyway, sorry. The reason this this run over, but by, by the way, folks, is because I joined the call. So my apologies. It's always my fault. I get the blame anyway. Okay, okay. right. It's all good. It's all good. Let's. Uh, it's been a good debate. And uh, you know, the last slides are a bit weak anyway. No, they're not. They're great. So let's uh, let's let's hit it. Right. So now just let it build, David. We're good. Uh, now this is a little bit from our kind of point of view. This is where we're heading as, you know, in terms of software, in terms of how we think we need to support the the, the, the market. So we've talked a lot about prioritization and, and typically often it's in a growth portfolio or a defined portfolio. You're prioritizing what needs to be done uh, in order to deliver better value. And there's huge value in that. And lots of organizations can benefit from it. So we're happy that today works. But actually, if we think of this tangentially, maybe we need to be a bit more prioritization driven in BAU and maintenance stuff. We can spin into change and transformation, the big stuff as well. So we need to sort of go vertical and, and think of prioritization as being something that exists everywhere, not just in a portfolio. Next, we talk about the portfolio portfolios. Um, we actually need the ability to put these different backlogs side by side in order to make good agile decisions about where we're gonna place our bets. If you've got huge swathes of resource locked in BAU, that's kind of a blob, then you're not, you've not got control. Your leadership don't have control of the organization because they can't make decisions about where they want to put their resource. So portfolio, portfolio is the idea that you can then have that kind of quantified visibility at a higher level. Next level, we talk about value-led scenarios. So again, as a service, what do we think the execs want? Do they want to see loads of charts and detail? No, they want to know which, can they have a PL that delivers their objectives over five years? Can they have reassurance that their strategic plan will be met if everything goes according to plan? And of course, that the plan underneath is reliable and deliverable and credible. So it's like, actually, we're not just convinced, we're not just slapping ourselves on the back and saying, great plan, knowing that it's a pile of horse manure. We know that it's a good plan, reliable plan, and what it will deliver. And we're giving execs the choice of how to do it. And finally, top of our pyramid for now, where we want to get to probably sort of back in the next year, is the ability to then turn value that we've talked about into a live data point, so similar to OKRs, really, that then flows through the project. So the point is, you can't just say, yes, that's a valuable project. It's great. Tick, tick, tick. Because we want to hold people to account for that projection of value through the delivery cycle of the project. And if that value doesn't materialize, people are held to account. If that value doesn't materialize, we can stop. Um, because actually, you know, things change and we need that kind of responsiveness. And finally, I think on my slides, just build it up. Right. So Again, how do we maybe see this kind of PMO, EPMO um, sort of division? So, you know, as a PMO, we should be taking the criteria across different silos, getting people to work together and relating that to the backlog and creating value and choice based on that data. And that's, that, again, huge progress, probably kind of 99% of, uh, of, of organizations out there. EPMO goes up a step again, where we say, actually, we need to understand the impact those projects are having on the organization in the context of market behavior, in the context of dumb luck, how things kind of work out, because actually the outcomes are gonna be related to the backlog and, the, and it's a success, but it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. And actually they're owning the outcome for the PNL, the non-financial KPIs, all that good stuff that pops out the end. And then how that relates back to those choices we made at the beginning is where we see that EPMO connection. And it's really being not in charge of it, that's someone else's job, right? That's, that's the exec's job, but it's being that support function that's gonna make a data-led process, a data-led connection between where you put your bets 
and where you get your returns. And, and the big spin here is is um, do, do you uh, do you grow up or, or expand your EPMO from being something that oversees the projects to also having a greater connectivity with the strategic pipeline, with the product portfolio? And, and your BAU workloads and help prioritize across not just the project portfolios, but, but the other workloads that you have as well. Mm. And, and, and to some extent, you know, if you can prove it works in the project space, hopefully that the execs will kind of bite and realize, hey, I want that across more areas because actually that ability to control and that ability to make choices is, you know, hopefully the basis of their success. So we covered through a lot. Um, what, what have we covered today? Well, we've um, ex uh, offered you the vision, the uh, purpose, to strategic objectives, and effective delivery is, is what uh, uh, defines us as a business. We've offered you the big framework, um, which essentially help, enables you to connect all those things up. Um, we've we've uh, explained how important we feel a PMO is in the context of big to certainly help us, us deliver uh, projects and and. Uh, we, we've suggested how, how a PMO can benefit from being in a big context as opposed to uh, fighting for itself uh, on it on its own within the org. Um, we've um, introduced prioritization and the capabilities uh, that, that Dan's described. We, we can systemize and, and lift up prioritization from uh, a simplistic uh, scoring to a more sophisticated uh, discussion uh, and, and uh, business enabling process. Um, we, we asked what's stopping you and we, we took a whole bunch of things there um, that uh, we'll summarize and play back to you. Um, we, we, we're we going to ask you about uh, what uh, what your EPMO did or, or whether what it could what it could do for you. And instead of asking you, we then said, well, you could do this and talked about the strategic process, the strategy implementation process and the ongoing balance of BAU change and products. And Dan's latterly wrapped up with with the, the the showing how PMO and EPMO sit alongside, and and how how immediate term value can can emerge from from those those two bodies. And, um, and like, like like most things, I think with with whether it's big or prioritization, um, hopefully we're starting to give you a sense of there is a ton of stuff out there and 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 a world of possibilities, and lots of opportunities to improve, and actually. Don't be too intimidated by the fact there's loads because there are some simple first steps you can make that will send you in the right direction. Um, and, you know, this can be iterative over time as you build up that value in layers um, because most organizations respond to success. So if you can introduce one thing successfully, it will spread. So the, the uh, we'll send you some links to the big body in Norwich so you can consume that at your leisure. Um, there's Deep Team. We did a, a session on how to promote your PMO and to, to grow it up with using Big as the, the enabler to do that. Uh, the, the link that uh, Dan showed to the prioritization criteria, that's there. We'll, we'll send that out too. And, and the call, call, finally, the calls to action are essentially, um, uh, if, if you think help Big can help you promote your PMO, then we're more than happy to talk to you about that. If you'd like to make make a case for an EPMO or or a, something bigger than your EPMO, we can help you make a case for that. Um, if you'd like to have a strategy to delivery conversation, if if that's not something you, your PMOs have got into so far, we can support that. And as as uh, Stuart and Dan have said, uh, if you want to explore the capabilities of of, of systematic prioritization, if you if you get it, if you if you really understand that. That uh, it's 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 a really good thing to to make make this systematic as opposed to a bun fight, then uh, then certainly speak we'll we'll have to have those conversations too. Um, anything to add, chaps? I think I think that's pretty much us. Um, if you wanted another picture to look at us in a different way, there's there's the pictures again. Uh, there there's our email addresses and and websites if you if you'd like to uh, to to have a dig. Um, We've talked about prioritization, the PMO and the place of the EPMO, business integrate governance and business purpose. Um, that that's that's us. That's that's all folks, as the big bunny would say. <laughs>